seconds before we formally get to introduce Katrina. Welcome YouTube and Stanford communities to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders Seminar. I am Ravi Balani, a lecturer in the Management Science and Engineering Department at Stanford and the Director of Alchemist, an accelerator for enterprise startups. The Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar is brought to you by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, or STVP, which is supported by, and the STVP is the Entrepreneurship Center in the School of Engineering at Stanford, and it's um, supported by BASIS, the, Biz the Business Association, or rather ETL is also supported by STVP and BASIS, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. We are incredibly honored and excited today to have Katrina Lake join us for this session of ETL. Katrina is the CEO of Stitch Fix and a Stanford alum. Katrina is the daughter of a mother who is a Japanese immigrant who, is, who taught in public schools in the United States and a father who is an American doctor. She went to Stanford and majored in economics and flirted with being pre-med, but ultimately went down the business path and went into consulting after Stanford, also worked in marketing at Polyvore, and then went and got her MBA at Harvard Business School. At the end of her MBA, she launched Stitch Fix, which is a fashion subscription service to help women everywhere discover and explore their style through a truly client-focused shopping experience. Six years later, in 2017, she took Stitch Fix public, becoming the youngest woman at the time to ever take a company public at the age of 34. Uh, Stitch Fix is now a $7.5 billion publicly traded company, and Forbes magazine has named Katrina one of America's richest self-made women. Um, we are honored to have Katrina here. So everybody, please welcome Katrina Lake to ETL. Um, Katrina, welcome. Um, lots of love for you, uh, virtual love on the YouTube and Stanford community streams. I would love to start off by understanding your path into entrepreneurship, because if you look on paper at your background, it doesn't appear that there are, se there are several people or models in your life that you could have self-reflected on um, that would have assured you that the path to entrepreneurship was one that you were destined for. And yet you've become sort of the poster child of becoming a self-made woman in the United States. You're, you know, your mom was a public school teacher. Your dad was a doctor. How did you discover the path of entrepreneurship? I mean, to be honest, you know, I, um, and thank you for having me and hi, everybody. It's great to be virtually back at the farm. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I think I reflect on this a lot because I do think that like a lot of people sometimes think like, oh, you went to Stanford. That must be where you like were inspired to be an entrepreneur. And, um, and even honestly, even at Stanford, where I think there is so much um, exposure to great entrepreneurs and where it is like such a clear career path for so many, even there, I don't think I realized that this was a path that was available to me. And so, um, you know, I think some of like some of why I think it's important for stories like my own to be shared is because I do think there are a lot of historical stereotypes around what entrepreneurs look like. And, um, and, you know, I think some of those, um, and there's many, many people who don't look like Mark Zuckerberg and don't look like Larry and Sergey or whoever, who are kind of like the, you know, the stories of Stanford lore. And there's a lot of other types of ways to be successful as entrepreneurs. There's a lot of people that look different in different backgrounds. And so, you know, I almost arrived at this path almost through process of elimination. Like I, I thought like, you know, apparel retail is super exciting and interesting. And, you know, my, thesis was like, I just want to be at whatever company is going to be um, like the leader of this space in 20 years. And, you know, ultimately, like I couldn't quite find any companies that I thought fit, fit that bill. And, you know, ultimately, like literally by process of elimination, I realized like, well, if I if I don't see a company that's doing it, like I can, you know, imagine it myself. Um, but the one thing that I would attribute in terms of my background is that and it's interesting, Ravi, I think you were the one actually who shared with me that like, you know, I do think being the, um, being the daughter of an immigrant, I think is a, I think just having, you know, having people in your family who immigrated from a country and took big risks and changed their lives. And, you know, having that narrative is just like a really, um, 
it's a really you know lucky thing, I guess. And I think you shared with me that that's one of the um, predictors of entrepreneurship, or it's one of the only things that correlates with being an entrepreneur. And um, and I think you know, kind of related to that, I, there are a couple stories in my childhood that I um, attribute to my belief in possibility and an expansive belief of anything being possible. And um, one of those is yes, my mom immigrated here from Japan, but what's kind of interesting is actually her mother, my Japanese grandmother, that like desperately wanted to be in the United States. And she was like born in Japan during the war. And I grew up during the war and um, idolized the United States and, um, you know, always felt like she should um, like dreamed of being an American someday. You know, she lived in Japan. She um, didn't learn to drive a car. She was in an arranged marriage. Like it was like, it was crazy that somebody in that context would think someday I'm going to be an American and, you know, through a long you know, way where it's like she had two daughters, she made sure her daughters went to college and encouraged them to go to grad school in the United States and like, and actually through her daughters was able to make her way to the United States eventually. And so that's one of them. And then the other one on my Caucasian side is that my, let's see, my grandfather was raised by two women. So he was raised by his mother and her sister because both of them, um, when my grandfather was only like a year and a half, he lost his father. And um, his mother's sister also was in a similar circumstance where um, both, you know, where, where both fathers passed away. And so now these two sisters had five kids in between them. And this was before welfare and before a lot of the social services that we know today. This is like a long time ago. And so these two sisters got together and they're like, you know, one of us is going to be like, she was actually a buyer at, um, she ended up becoming a buyer at a department store um, in Minnesota. But like one of them was like, I'm going to go to work. The other one's going to take care of the kids. And so they had this household that was led by two women. And so like my grandfather, my Japanese or my American grandfather, he like taught me how to use a computer. He taught me to ride a bike. He taught me to drive. Like, you know, he had this belief that like girls and women can do anything because of his upbringing. And so, you know, I think these narratives, this probably seems like a random aside, but I think these narratives are really important. And I think, you know, as we think about like, how, how do we instill, and now I have two young children. And then as you think about like, you know, how do you instill in children and in young people, this, you know, this belief that anything is possible. And, you know, I think, while I'm incredibly proud of the journey that I've had. And I think I've come, I've overcome a lot to do this. I feel like I've overcome less than some of these you know, <laughs> people in my family that I've heard about. I'm like, you think like taking a company is public, like, whoa, like raising five kids, like with, you know, with, I mean, that was a crazy thing to yeah. do. Or like, you know, imagining that you could be an American someday when you were in arranged marriage in Japan, like that's insane, you know? And so I think just like having those having those as like the benchmarks in your mind of like, oh, these are the things that people do. And like, that's normal. It actually like creates a really expansive mindset. And so, you know, I think these narratives we tell are super important. I think, you know, to be able to have these and everybody, I'm sure every single one of you listening has narratives in your family of like people who've done incredible, amazing, totally, you know, beat the odds things. And like, I think those things are really important to celebrate because it really changes your mindset. It really changes what you believe is possible for yourself. I love this um, because, you know, I think these undercurrents of your lineage are actually much more powerful indicators of having that spirit of entrepreneurship and you know, the gifts of being a first or second generation American is that thing that's baked into you. That's actually very hard to actually be taught. That's just sort of embedded in you. And it is very much of the Maya Angelou ilk of, you know, I enter in a room as one, but I have a thousand people behind me. Um, I and I, I do think though that we oftentimes don't discuss these things. And so very, especially when you're going into a new path, where there aren't people that stereotypically you can self-reflect that look like you, it's very, many people have imposter syndrome. They feel that they weren't deserved, that they didn't deserve, that they're not supposed to be on that path. Many people, even at Stanford, forget entrepreneurship, just being a student at Stanford, feel like they have imposter syndrome. Um, did you ever feel like you had imposter syndrome? Um, and if so, or if not, what advice do you have to those who feel like they have that? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I will try not to go on a total rant about this, but I mean, this imposter syndrome thing drives me nuts because I mean, I get asked this a lot and I understand the sentiment of it. And I think what I think is most, um, like, I, I just hate the whole concept of it because I feel like when you say imposter syndrome, it makes it sound like something's wrong with me. 
Like I have the problem. And I'm like, no, no, no. If I am feeling excluded in your environment or in your community or in your whatever fill in the blank, like you're the one with the problem. Like I don't have a syndrome, like you have something to fix. And so, you know, I think there's actually an amazing, there's a great article that was written actually like last week in HBR that was um, the, the, the title of it is like, stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. It's, you know, it's, it's broader than that. I think anybody can feel imposter syndrome. You don't have to be a woman, but it talks actually, it's a very interesting um, when I go on rants on it, I didn't actually know a lot of like the historical context of the word and how it really was specifically targeted towards women for a long time. But I do think like, you know, as a community, we have work to do where it's like, you know, as a business community, we have work to do as like, even in places in Stanford, like there's probably majors in Stanford or classrooms in Stanford where there's groups of people that feel like they don't belong there and they don't feel included. And rather than making it seem like that's something that's wrong with them, like that should be our communal problem that we have to solve to make sure that people People can feel um, equal access to success and that people can feel, um, you know, included in those contexts. And so, um, you know, I hope that the narrative changes a little bit on this because like it just puts the burden on like women and underrepresented communities of like, oh, you have the problem. I'm like, I have a problem. Like, You're pro- yeah, everybody that's else. That mean, but it's, yeah, I love that. I think that's great. Well, you know, I think also the proof is in the pudding. So you were you've been designated by Forbes to be one of America's richest self-made women. I think in January of this year, you were designated officially to be a billionaire, becoming one of, I think, 19 female self-made billionaires in the United States. That's against, I think, over 200 self-made male billionaires in the United States. Um, And I'd love to talk about that if we can a little bit. Um, Before I get into the gender dynamics, a lot of people are enamored with money. You know, um, Obviously, there is the, you know, the famed song, I want to be a billionaire so freaking bad, you know, on the cover of Forbes, Forbes magazine with Oprah and the Queen. You are now in that ilk of, you know, with Oprah and, and Sheryl Sandberg. And you've, I think you, you're one of the newest, if not the newest sort of American made billionaires. While it's fresh, can you tell people honestly, what does it feel like to be a billionaire? What does it feel like to cross that milestone? Is that something that you felt was significant? You know, I mean, if I'm really honest, like it, it, it really doesn't feel any different. It doesn't. And to be clear also, like these are paper, you know, these are all just correlated with whatever, with whatever the stock price does. Like, um, and so, um, you know, obviously a lot of my wealth is tied up in such fixed stock. And so, um, you know, of course I hope that it continues to do very well, but like, you know, these things don't, honestly, like, I think what's a little hard for me is like, this has never been a primary source of motivation for me. Like, you know, I don't think like, you know, being famous is not a motivation for me. Like, you know, being rich was really not, you know, was not a motivation for me. And so like, you know, I have my own political and social beliefs that conflict with where I am in like in my career and where I am in society. Um, And, you know, I think that like, you know, for like, for me, I started Stitch Fix because I was intellectually super interested in this problem. And I felt like this, I wanted a job that was intellectually stimulating where I felt like I could, you know, create change. And like, and, you know, I started Stitch Fix for very, you know, for reasons that were really more of just like, this is the job I'd like to have. And like, I can create this myself. And, um, you know, wealth was really not part of the equation. And, you know, I think what's, what's just like a, and I don't know if this is going to be true for many, for everybody, but like, you know, I would say, you know, getting to like $10 million or something like that was very powerfully motivating to be able to feel like, you know, I could, hit a milestone that meant that like me and my family would be comfortable and that we'd be able to whatever, like that is a very, very powerful milestone, you know, then getting to, uh, you know, these crazy numbers with all of these zeros, like, you know, it's not like, I don't find that as, as much of the motivation. And so I think it's, you know, it's interesting that like societally, there's a lot of obsession around it. And maybe for others, they find that path really, really motivating. But like, you know, I believe that we can motivate people in general through actually different means. Like, I think people find purpose really motivating. I think people find impact really motivating. Like, I actually think there's a lot of other things that are more motivating to people than dollars. And, you know, I think as a society, like, I think, you know, capitalism is one where you are, you know, where you assume that like the primary motivation of people is money. And I, you know, I'm not sure that that's totally correct. It's great to just hear it from, because I think people um, say that it's great to hear it from somebody who's actually in the experience. The air is not sweeter now that you've got, you know, this much money or whatever. It's the same, it's the same drive. But can we, can you comment though on why you think there's so few female self-made billionaires 
relative to males, it's an order of magnitude difference. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I could spend the whole rest of my time on this, but I mean, you know, the world is fraught with bias and discrimination and a lack of fairness and equality. And like, I would say it's one of the things that, you know, when I was at Stanford and like, I, you know, I, like, I loved economics. I mean, I, I did Humbio also, but like, I loved economics where I felt like, oh, in a perfect world, like this and this and this happens. Like our world is not perfect. Like it is, I think it's actually been one of the most like depressing and stunning things, I think, as I've gone through this of just realizing how bias is baked in at every single step along the way. And like, you know, I was probably raising like 20 cents on the dollar relative to what other white, what, what, what white men out there were able to do. Like, you know, and I, and even now being a publicly traded company, like when I'm sitting across the table from invest, from potential investors of public equities, like, and you kind of think of like, oh, the great equalizer, the stock market. And it's like, it's, you know, it's still wrought with bias. Like there's still portfolio managers that are largely white men on the other side of the table deciding, oh, this company is really valuable and this one's not. And, you know, I think people have a lot harder time building trust across lines of difference. Like we know this. And so every time I'm sitting across the table from somebody who doesn't look like me, which is most of the time in this world, like I am, you know, I am at a disadvantage. And so, you know, I, I don't say that to complain. I don't say that to whatever, but like, you know, when, when it is not, you know, it is not accidental that like we are, you know, that it is much, much harder for certain groups to reach these levels of wealth and to reach these levels of success. Like this is something that like structurally as a society has, you know, has, been ingrained for hundreds of years and you know we've made some progress but I think like still the reality is that the people that are largely in positions of power are largely the same types of people that were in positions of power 100 years ago and you know that systemic that systemic bias um you know creates real headwinds for for, for entrepreneurs who um um, you know, who might come from a different background, who might look different, who, you know, who might not be instantly relatable to the people who, um, you know, are making decisions around who gets to make, who gets to, you know, who gets to raise capital and who doesn't and, you know, which companies are the best and which ones aren't. So, and so can you talk about how you navigated that path? I know there's a lot um, of steps between starting the company to where you're at, um, given this environment that exists. But what, what I guess what I would be curious about is, can you talk about even just the fundraising process when you're pitching to VCs for a service that's focused on a demographic tip- different than the typical VC? Um, how do you navigate that fundraise? And how do you pitch to potential investors that don't reflect at all your target customer demographic? Can you add color to that experience? Yeah, I mean, that happened all the time. And, um, you know, I think the world has gotten slightly better since I was raising money from VCs 10 years ago. But, you know, all the time I would get comments like, oh, well, you know, I just, I I don't see why anybody would want a service like this or like, oh, oh, my wife, you know, is, why is this any better than my, my wife's personal shopper at Saks? <laughs> like, these are just like not even relevant. And, you know, and I think there's a time when, um, like said, we got to the final rounds of a lot of venture of a lot of venture firms, and like we got to, and we would like oftentimes we get to the final round, meet the whole partnership, do the whole song and dance, and then not quite get there. And I mean, I had one um, VC who was very kind to like kind of share more context, and you know, he was like, I get to choose one or two board seats a year, and he's like, I love my job, I'm really lucky, I love my job, and like I want to pick board seats where like I you know, where I like live and breathe the company, I wake up every day thinking about it. And like, I want to add value to you as a board member. And he was like, and I just, I don't think I can wake up in the morning thinking about women's dresses. And like, I just don't think I can add a lot of value to you in this space. And like, that was really heartbreaking because look, like I've made similar decisions too. Like I am on the board of Glossier because I love the brand because I love Emily. Like I purposely did not join the board of, you know, a casual gaming company or whatever else that doesn't fit my passions and what I'm excited about about. And so, you know, if you think about the, you know, the kind of lack of diversity in that VC world, and just like what, um, you know, what, what likely those people will be gravitating towards, like I used to joke, it would be like, you know, I would have had an easier time raising money for an app that helped 
guys navigate or guys organize their t-ball leagues for their kids like that was a pain point that like all these men really understood and like that would have been easier for you to raise money for than a company that i have now that you know has almost two billion dollars in revenue and is in a 400 billion dollar market opportunity and um and so you know i think that like it it is challenging i think when um again like coming back to just the lack of diversity that's in those decision makers and you know who gets money like it depends like it dictates a lot of things it's like which companies get founded like which people are going to be accumulate generational wealth what kind of company cultures are going to be created where like you know my children are going to work like all of these things end up actually being decided by a pretty small group of people and a pretty small group of people that's not very representative of of like our broader population and their needs. Um, and so, you know, I think there's no question we need more there. I mean, in terms of my tips for it, like I do think at the end of the day, like this is, you know, I am a very quantitative person. Like this is a, actually like a great business and it has been a great business for a long time. And so, you know, I really relied on my own handle of the numbers and of cohorts and of the financial statements and really being able to show people like, look, even if you don't feel like you can wake up excited about personalizing in women's apparel, like, you know, you can at least wake up and get excited about like the size of the business and the size of the market opportunity and like, you know, the profitability profile of the company. And so, you know, I had to focus on different ways to get people excited. Um, and to be clear, like we, in the end, like we found great investors who are, who've been, you know, great, you know, mostly have been great um, backers of the company and um, many of whom are still involved in the company today. And I feel very lucky that I was able to find that along the way, but, you know, it definitely is not always an easy path. Yes. And I do love the fact that, you know, going back to, you know, you can, this is uh, making money is, is, is a great thing. And, and appealing to like that, that core and having that core inside that you know the solidity of the business. I want to spend time on just the, the path on how you actually built the business out. Um, if I can, though, there is you know, a, a sensitive subject, which I'd love to, which I'd like to broach. Well, it's been, let me just say this, it's been reported in the press that there was a venture capitalist that funded you that you faced sexual harassment from. And like any entrepreneur, you needed that venture capitalist support to raise future rounds with future investors. And that, um, and that venture capitalist, because of that, you had to sign an NDA um, to effectively not discuss the sexual harassment in order to continue the, 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 the path of the company forward. Um, I know that you are still bound by that NDA. And so I'm not gonna be asking about that. Um, I, I, I do just wanna take though my moderator uh, prerogative and just mention it. Um, what I would like to ask is this, you know, it's been now, I think, seven years since the start of the Me Too movement. Um, do you think things have gotten better? Yeah, it's a good question. Yes, thank you. I, I cannot speak to it. Um, and um, but, you know, I mean, it's it's an interesting question, like have things gotten better? Like I, you know, on the flip side, like I um, or on the pro side, like I was kind of maybe not that recent because I was actually sitting face to face with somebody, which seems now like years ago. But um, I was meeting with an entrepreneur who was like, you know, she was like, I read all the stuff that you had to deal with. And she was like, I like, I can't believe that that happened. And like, it's so mind blowing that you had to like, thank you for paving the way. And it's crazy. You had to go through that. And like, honestly, like part of me was like that cool that like you think that was crazy it's like you know when me too came out like you know I had many friends that had crazy oh this crazy thing happened to me and this crazy thing happened to me and so you know I think that like you know within the course of you know I guess this woman was probably 10 years younger than me you know and in the course of 10 years that to her it would be unfathomable that people that women would have to face this type of stuff at work like that's kind of cool I'm like you know from my generation like people dealt with that kind of stuff. And it was kind of like the price of doing business and that now it's, you know, unfathomable, like that's great. But also like, it's just like the bare minimum, right? It's almost like saying like, oh, this, you know, underrepresented group is like no longer being physically assaulted in the streets. And so now things are better. And it's like, you know, there's still tons of bias and discrimination. And so, you know, I think the fact that like those types of crazy things happen less and um, like that, that's, a great thing, obviously, and we should be happy for that. But I do think like, ultimately, the reason that a lot of those types of things were allowed to happen for decades and decades is because of the vast inequity and bias in our system, right? Like if everybody looks like 
a certain type of person. Like it makes it very easy for these types of behaviors to, to become normalized. And, you know, and if obviously like if at all these venture funds, if like half the team were women, like this type of stuff probably never would have happened. And so, you know, I think it's like at the end, like it is, you know, it's great that I think we've made some progress. Like I do think that like there's an acknowledgement of a lot of bad behavior that was happening that is probably no longer happening. But I view that as table stakes. Like the progress that I want to see is I want to see better representation at the top. Like I want to see better representation on cap tables. I want to see better representation in the GPs of uh, venture funds. Like, you know, we need to see more equal representation at the top in order to really see the progress that we need to see. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I am going to be um, students. I'm going to be going to your questions in about 10 minutes. There's so much wealth that I want to, and I know we're going to have such limited time, um, but I, I want to shift now towards just talking about leadership because you are one of the most well-respected leaders and people self-reflect on how confident you are and how you lead um, uh, and, and create and make people better. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, can you describe, Katrina, how would you describe your leadership style? You know, I it's probably evolved a little bit over time, but I would say the thing that really has stayed the same is like, I do see like, I don't know, authenticity and vulnerability is like a real cornerstone of it. And, you know, I feel, I don't want to say lucky in this, but like, I think one of the like, side effects of like, I, you know, I started a company when I like, I had literally managed nobody before, like, I had, you know, I'd worked hourly jobs, like I had two, like junior jobs after, um, you know, after college. Um, but like, I had managed one intern, and that was the only person who I'm still in touch with Dan, who's wonderful. But um, like, I'd managed exactly one person before I started Stitch Fix. And now we have like 9000 employees, right. And so a lot of you know, what I've learned, I've learned on the job. And so, you know, I think one of the good things about like knowing that, you know, nothing is that like, you know, the only thing that I had and like, I, I didn't have some amazing resume. I didn't have, you know, I wasn't the best coder in the room or whatever. Like I didn't have some accolade that like, that, you know, was like, you should be the CEO. All I had really was like an ability to bring people along and like, you know, being authentic with people about what's happening, about how I'm feeling about, you know, being vulnerable about like what I feel like I'm good at, what I'm not, like what are my areas of development? You know, all of these things are ways that I can build trust. And like the ultimate goal is like, you know, you might trust somebody because you think they're the world's best coder or you trust somebody because you know who they are and you know their values and you feel like you connect with them as a human. And that's an even deeper level of trust. And so, you know, I think that like in retrospect, I, I'm so glad that that's where I always invested my time because I think ultimately trust that you're building through the humanness of connection and, you know, and being able to share some of yourself and understand that in others, like that's a much more powerful foundation of trust, I think, than a lot of these other ones. But, um, but it really, I think it's, um, you know, I think it was just organically the way that I figured out that I could lead that I think now is, um, you know, one of the, I don't know, I think it's now a superpower in leaders, honestly, is like being able to be authentic and being able to be vulnerable and being able for people, you know, at all levels of the organization to feel connected to you. Well, I think a lot of people wrestle with that because how do you, what does that tactically mean? Like, how do you actually lead with vulnerability? Because uh, I think, I think it's still ingrained in people that if you're putting yourself in, uh, does that mean that you have, and I assume it does, that as a leader, you have to be putting yourself in situations of vulnerability. And if you do, I think a lot of people feel that that will um, create instability in the organization. If the leader, it doesn't, if the leader uh, is questioning themselves. Um, can you speak to that? Do you put yourself in situations of vulnerability and can you give examples if you do? Yeah. I mean, all the time. And, you know, I think, and, and, you know, to be clear also, like, but even, I think even in the big decisions, like I was just going to say, like, you want to be firm on the big decisions of the company, but even those, like, like, I mean, I can stand up in front of the company and be like, this is what we decided to do. This is why we decided to do it. Like, you know, if I'm really honest, like we had a lot of conversations because like it's risky in these ways and I'm a little worried this part might not work out. And like, you know, I get that these are the reasons not to, but like at the end of the day, this is why I decided it. And like, you know, and that's a vulnerable way to be able to like, stand by a decision, but also recognize that like, hey, the, like it's not obvious. Like, I think a lot of times people think that like, you know, it's really, really clear. Like you just weigh the pros and cons and it's obvious you run the DCF model and you should definitely do it this. And like, that's not the way decisions are made, honestly. And so, you know, I think like that, I don't know, like, I think just like sharing more of that, like behind the scenes, like in general, and I'll, I'll tell a funny story that actually relates to Stanford. 
like you know I think the more like you can get comfortable with like those awkward vulnerable like you know no you some situation you know you're going to be able to laugh out later like kind of situations and like an example from Stanford is that um when I went to Stanford um squash was like a club sport um and one of I lived I lived in Ujima and um my friend who lived in Eucalypto I think in Lagunita uh, my friend who lived in Eucalypto she was the first person to get recruited from the East Coast to, to join the squash team. And so, um, you know, I knew nothing about this sport. Like I grew up in San Francisco mostly and like knew nothing about this sport. And, um, but I knew my friend had been recruited for it. Anyway, long story short, I'll try to tell it in a short version. Um, but long story short, like, you know, it was like a Wednesday night and she called me a Wednesday afternoon and she called me and was like, Ken, this is so random. She was like, but like, you know, our number eight player is super sick and like can't get on a plane. Our number 11 players in a four hour lab and we can't get a hold of her. Our number 12 player went home to see her parents in Sacramento. Like our number 13 player, I, I, right? Like blah, blah, blah. She's like, this probably won't happen but like if we are super super desperate we're supposed to be taking a red eye to you know to new haven to new or whatever maybe to new york i forget how we've got there but she's like we're taking a red eye to connecticut or whatever tonight and um worst case scenario we need like she's like we need a warm body or else we can't play she's like we need 10 warm bodies on the court or we can't play she's like worst case scenario would you be willing to come i was like i i'm not even good at tennis like i don't even know what sport this is like she was like, but do you have plans this weekend? And would you be able to come? I was like, sure. And so like, you know, I assumed they were going to find somebody else, but like hours passed and she calls me. She's like, so we couldn't find anybody else. And like, can you come? And so I show up and I get on the plane and I was like, and you know, she'd been like, oh, we'll teach you on the plane. Like we took like a red eye, like there was no teaching me on the plane. And so we get to, you know, we get to it was at it was at Yale and this was the national tournament, the national squash tournament. That's like, you know, like all the best teams. And um, and I had never set foot on a squash court in my life. And so, like, you know, I <laughs> I get there. It, I mean, it was so it was so embarrassing. Like I thank God this was before like UGC, like, and that there probably hopefully is no video footage of this out there, but like, it was so humiliating. Like if anybody knows what squash is, it's like a ball, it has to be warmed up. People are like, bang, bang, bang. And they're like, you know, and they're people, it's a really athletic sport. People are really fast all over the court. And like, you know, and I had to play all all weekend I had to play in like seven different things like our first one was against Cornell who was like you know a top 10 team and this girl who'd been playing squash for her whole life has to play me and like it, like it was so and she like was warming up the ball and then she like lobbed it over to me and it's like I'm whiffing and like I I mean it was so humiliating and um and I had to stand up there every single you know, you had to play multiple people every, I mean, it was just crazy. And so I played every single round and literally never returned to serve the entire time. And so these matches were really short, which is good for the embarrassment factor. Um, and then of course, one of the matches, I saw a girl that I knew from high school, like in the stands and like, to this day, I'm like, this must be how she remembers me because like, I have not seen her since. And I didn't have a chance to explain myself to be like, actually, I've never played squash. All I know is that she spectated and saw me like be horrible at squash. And that like, wherever she is in the world now, that's probably her memory of me is that I was like a horrible squash player. Anyway, I tell that whole long story because my point is, is like, now I can laugh about it. And it's like, you know, and I mean, I even laughed about it then, let's be honest. But I think like, the more you can put yourself in these situations where like, it's embarrassing, it's awkward, it's whatever, but you just like, it's just like anything, like you get better at it, you get used to it, like go to a hip hop dance class, like go, you know, sing karaoke or do whatever the thing that seems like it's mildly embarrassing and like, just keep on doing mildly embarrassing things. And then they eventually won't be that embarrassing anymore. And and, and those are things like that, you know, create commonality and the more people feel like, you know, oh, well, other people have embarrassing experiences too. Like it humanizes you. Sorry. Just, now we wasted like a lot of time talking about squash. It's an important lesson. It's such an important lesson. I think it's actually the heart of this notion of entrepreneurship and resilience. I just don't want people to um, lose the lesson, which is you just to be clear, you're not the type of person who goes into this just saying, you know, I don't care. And so, you know, I can do these things because I don't care. Um, uh, and, and I don't want to be putting words into your mouth, but do you think of yourself as a confident person or do you think of yourself as a sensitive person? 
when it comes to doing these things, when you're putting yourselves in these situations? And um, are you deliberately putting yourself into these situations of vulnerability even today? Um, uh, and is it more than just telling people about your concerns, like on, on what you think the risks or the contingencies are? Is it actually putting yourself physically into situations of vulnerability perpetually? Yeah, I mean, I, with COVID and stuff, I've done it less, honestly. But like, I mean, I love going to like a ballet class or a hip hop dance class. I can tell you I'm not very good at either of those things. And like, you know, I think I think it's like a huge, it's a humbling experience. And so like the short answer to your question is like, I really, I am a confident person. Like I really am. And I'm not sure that I would have said that honestly, when I was a student at Stanford and like, I, I don't know that I would have said that. And I do think like, like a lot of things, like it's learned, it's a skill that you can actually develop over time. And like, I think the more that you can do scary things or things that like might hurt your ego, and then you come out of it and you're like, mm, that didn't hurt my ego. That actually wasn't that bad. And like, the more you do that, like, I think the more you realize how resilient you are. And I think so much of the confidence question is just like, it's, it's a fear. It's a fear of the unknown a little bit. Right. When did you know that you were, so it, that's really fascinating at Stanford. If I asked Stanford Katrina, I said, are you confident in your soul of souls? You would have said, no, I'm not confident. I, I, it's a really, I wish I could go back in time. Probably. I, yeah. I don't know. But do you, I certainly do you know, don't know that I would have said yes. Or when, when the life phase time was when you said I am confident. I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, weirdly, like even like the, you would think that being said no to like 50, like you would think that like 50 venture investors telling me no would make me less confident. I actually would argue that like that, I mean, and maybe that's like the squash thing, right? Like it actually ultimately, I think maybe more confident. Like I kind of felt like more conviction that like, you know, you, you may not see it, but like, I really believe in this. And so like, I think if any, like, you know, I think a lot of those, um, you know, like rejection in general, like, you know, getting rejected from jobs, getting rejected from schools, like, ironically, I, I think like those things actually, like in the right light can actually make you more confident rather than less And um, And so I do think like, you know, Amazon is a company, for example, like they do a lot of like celebrating failure and whatever. And like, I, you know, I think we could be definitely be better about that at Stitch Fix. But I think there's a lot to that, because I do think that like, um, you know, a lot of like the hard times and whatever, like those are what make us stronger. And like, you know, I think you can, I mean, if, you know, if, if any of you, hopefully many of you have not, but if any of you have had like a traumatic thing happen in your family or like an illness in your family, like, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing, but oftentimes like the family comes out stronger and you've said things to your family that you wouldn't have normally said, and you feel more connected to your family. And like, you know, I think that those like, you know, going through hard things makes you stronger and like the squash story or the going to a hip hop dance, like those are all just micro versions of that, that I think are exercising the same muscle. Yes. So it sounds like if you have a fear of failure, which is what actually prevents many people from pursuing the path that they're supposed to do in this life, the guidance is just get comfortable with failure. Just throw yourself. Yeah. Like I've seen, I forget what it was in, but like I read, to be clear, I haven't done this, but like I did some, I read something about how somebody was like trying to get rejected every day. And so like every single day they would like go to a stranger on the street and be like, can I borrow $5? Or like, you know, just try to try to get rejected every day because because then you get like, you build a muscle for it. And to be clear, I have no recollection of where this anecdote was from, but I remember thinking to myself, like, you know, like I, I didn't do that, but like, that's kind of a cool way to do it too. It's just like, the more you can exercise that muscle in, in many ways, I think the more, you know, the stronger you get. It's a great, great lesson. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to the student questions now um, in our final uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, the most uploaded question is from YouTube chat and it's asking how does Stitch Fix fit into the future of fashion, which we are now aware has to have sustainability and circular products at its core. Um, product life, fair wages, carbon issues, and sustainable fabrics. Totally. I mean, this is definitely a topic that's near and dear to my heart and something we spent a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, I think that there are, I mean, there's some interesting, like Stitch Fix in general, like I think the history of apparel has been like cheap and like, I don't know, cheap and yeah, whatever, like mostly cheap, but right. Like where it's like, oh, let's buy some, let's buy things that are super cheap and trendy or super cheap and disposable. And there's no question that that has to go away for like a number of reasons. And so, you know, I think first and foremost, like, you know, we are focused on like, we don't want you to buy a hundred 
jeans from us that are 70% off. Like we want you to buy like one or two pairs of jeans for us that are like really great jeans for you. And so in a world in which people are buying fewer things, which like, I do believe that is the future, like a model like Stitch Fix where we are getting to know you, we are sending you what you want. Like that is a much more sustainable uh, version of that. And I would also, I mean, a side note, we could talk about sustainability for the next hour, but a side note is like when you look at retailers like dollar for dollar, just so everybody knows this when they're making their purchase decision, e-commerce is actually wildly more um, sustainable from a carbon footprint perspective than um, store retail. And part of that is like if you, you know, many of you probably come from places that are hot or cold, like the sustainability element of heating and cooling a huge department store. Like you think of how tall those ceilings are. You think of how few transactions happen in there. Like just like the huge store footprint that we've built is like not, it's one of the worst things that we've been, we've done for, for our environment, certainly from a retailing perspective. And so even in Stitch Fix, when you compare, like, you know, people are trying things on, sending it back. Like you would think that has a bigger carbon footprint. It actually doesn't. We are a fractional amount of what department stores do. So of course that's still not enough. There's still a lot more that we can do. We've made commitments and you can go and look at, um, we have a social impact page. We've made commitments around um, having, um, having all of our um, exclusive brands have more sustainable fabrics. The circular economy, I think is wildly interesting. Like I think, you know, I would love to um, like there are lots of things in my closet that would happily have a second life. And, you know, we already have great data, like what Stitch Fix is differentiated at is that we have great data, we can really predict the right things for the right people. That's better in a first person world, just to be clear, also, because we are not in the business of overproducing and overmaking things. And then, um, you know, we are only buying the products that we know will have ha happy homes. But in a secondhand world, it's even more interesting, I think, because like, even in the first hand world, it's hard enough to find jeans that fit. But like, you know, you're trying to navigate years and years of different designers apparel, like all of a sudden you really need recommendations. Like I think anybody who's tried to buy in a secondhand market knows like, you know, if you know exactly what you want, like it might be easier, but like you could spend hours and hours and hours and hours trying to weed through that. And so, um, Anyway, long winded way of saying like, you know, I think there's a lot of innovation coming here. I'm excited about the direction that things are going. And, you know, I really hope that Stitch Fix can be at the forefront of it. Awesome, that's great. Um, the next question is what specific segment of the massive clothing fashion sector are you targeting? Affordable fast fashion, boutique brands, vertically integrated clothing production, dress code specific, religious, lower middle, upper class, and why? How do you yeah. think about yeah, I mean, so apparel is a $400 billion market in the US and the UK alone. And that's kind of where we play right now. You know, I think what's interesting strategically is that historically fixes have been really like, you know, the first eight or nine years of our business were really focused around fixes, which is you sign up, you let us know what types of things you like. We have a stylist that's using algorithms to deliver to you things to try on at home. Um, and that, um, and so that model is really a little bit more of like a lean back and shop for me model. And, you know, that had an element, like you could either get that delivered when you like, or you could get it delivered on a cadence if you like. Um, but so that, you know, that was kind of the first version. And then really this next model is actually like, you know, potentially more so you know, more than 50% of people in the United States say that they hate shopping. And so this lean back and shop for me works great for them. But there's also a lot of people that want to have more say and want to be, you know, kind of more, you know, I guess more proactive in their decisions around fashion. And so, you know, one of the things that we've been doing is we have this, um, we have shop, which is a way that people can actually explore their recommendations. And there's a lot of innovation to come that really allows us to be able to have people who even people who want to have be, you know, more in the front, you know, more in the driver's seat that they would actually be able to also experience the great recommendations. And so, um, you know, so those have been kind of just like psychographically, but you know, we, we are very like, we're, our audience is super democratic. Like we have a really broad age range, even on income, like we're pretty broad income range. And, you know, because we are in the business of personalization, you know, we can actually address many, you know, many of those segments. Um, there's a question from a Stanford student, which is what is something you would have done different at Stanford that could have helped you in your entrepreneurship path? And if I could, Tina Selig, our director, has a favorite question, which I'd love to ask too, which is, um, what do you wish you knew? What, what, what do you wish you would have known when you were 20? It's different. I, I got it a little bit wrong, but what, what advice would you give yourself at, or would you give our other 20-year-olds? I mean, what would I have done differently at Stanford? I mean, ironically, like I, you know, like I 
Um, and these were all the right things to do, but like, you know, I, I had a part-time job the whole time I was at Stanford. I like, I really was focused on like the bare, I don't want to say the bare minimum, but it was like, I had an econ major and a hum bio minor. I graduated a quarter early. Like, you know, I was, I, I probably was like, I mean, of course, you know, all these things are 2020 when you can look back, but you know, like part of me wishes, like, I wish I hadn't like forced my, you know, like, I don't know. I just wish it would have relaxed a little bit maybe and like taken, taking classes that weren't necessarily ones that were directly connected to the major. Like, I wish I had taken more weird classes. Like, I feel like there were a bunch of like the, like the one where like the dog falls asleep, you know, that class, like it was like, oh, sleep and dreams, like that class, like everybody talked about sleep and dreams. And like, you know, there were a bunch of like these legendary classes, like learning to golf, like that sounds so silly, but like, or play tennis or like, I don't know, do something cool, like play squash. Like, I don't know. I wish I had learned like some other skill, like with all the great resources that Stanford had. Um, and so, I mean, interestingly, like none of my regrets, honestly, are like, like even like learning to code or whatever. It's actually not really one of my regrets. Like I actually Actually, my regrets are more like I wish I had spent more time doing things that are like are were less academic I think than like the things that I did and um and just you know spent more time on the more like global notion of learning besides like the more targeted version of learning that I was doing to kind of achieve what I thought were my goals at the time um and then advice that I would give to myself I mean honestly the advice I would have given to myself for this whole journey is more of just like how like like, I just don't even think I had the capacity to think on as big of a scale that like, you know, I sadly, like I was not sent, I was not like walking around the pitch deck about how like, this is going to be a billion dollar business in less than 10 years. And we were going to go public in less than 10 years. Like, I, I didn't even imagine that, like, that wasn't even at the upper end of what I thought was possible for the business. And so I do think that like, just, you know, like how, I don't know, like, I, I guess I would have like tried to help myself to like think bigger and like, you know, I, and like believe in more possibility, I think than I even even did at the time. And, um, and then the general advice that I give that I think I was fairly lucky to be able to mostly have this is like, you know, I do think like in careers, like people really obsess over, like, you know, does this job define me? And like, is this, you know, is like, is this job really me? And like, I think they're just like, I don't know, I think there should be like a healthy delineation between like something can be your job and it doesn't need to be your identity. And I think, you know, my generation struggles with this a lot of just like, you know, I think feeling really inextricably tied to like the role that you're in in that moment. And like that creates, you know, pros and cons, right? I think like if you, if you get laid off by a company or you leave a company, like all of a sudden you feel like some of your identity is gone and that's not a great thing. And, and on the flip side, like if you feel like your the company is not aligned with your identity, it becomes, you know, a very tumultuous, hard thing. And I get that, but I think, I don't know, like I would love, I, I think like being able to have more of that, like healthy separation and like, and I talk about like, you know, I think that the, like if, if you have two things in your job, like if you are feeling challenged, you're learning, you're on the steep part of the learning curve. If you have that and you have a manager who is in support of your development and helping you grow and investing in you, like if you have those two things, like, like that's the promise land. Like that's like the way, you know, I think there's a lot of like, I don't know, like, I feel like I had a very linear notion of like, this is how you get to point A to point B. And to be clear, honestly, like, I kind of followed that, like, you know, this is advice that I didn't necessarily follow myself, but I was a little bit like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to business school. I'm going to start a company. And like, I did have a pretty linear path, but like what I've learned now is that I'm actually in the minority. Like most people's paths are not linear. Like most people are just following really interesting opportunities or really interesting people and following growth opportunities. And then they end up someplace interesting. And so, you know, I think that like, anyway, this, this is my 20 year old self would have been bored by now. So I'll stop. No, this is all. Cool. <laughs> and there's a question that's dovetailing what you're saying, which might be our last question, which is, you know, on this, that second piece that you were talking about for your development, which is a manager or a mentor. Um, how did, did you have a mentor? Because you were going down these paths where there weren't that many, I think, self-reflected mentors uh, that you would normally be there. Um, and so how did you find your mentors if you in fact did have a mentor or how did you yeah. I, I mean, I have, I've had different mentors along the way. And um, like Polyvore, you mentioned, I was at Polyvore for a summer and the women's who kinder. Um, I mean, she was like, she was so like, she was, I was like enamored with her because she was like the first time that I had met a leader that was like, 
very decidedly not trying to fit into the mold of like kind of the stereotypical, you know, kind of leader you would have. And she was very feminine in her, her leadership. And there's just so much that I was like, wow, like this is really eye opening that you can lead in different ways. And, um, and she was somebody that I kept in touch with periodically. And even now being like a publicly traded company, like there are people out there that, um, you know, there are people out there that, um, that have like texted me and have like, you know, so like, I don't know, just like reached out of like literally the ether being like, Hey, I'm happy to chat whenever. And I, and I try to do the same thing when, um, you know, when I see others. And so, you know, I think, you know, interestingly, like, you know, the mentors have definitely changed over the years, but I felt, I felt really, really fortunate to have lots of people, um, you know, men and women, I think who are, um, in roles where they, um, you know, have, have contributed to my success. Okay. This last one, I, I just do want to answer this last one of like, what have I done to help women of color gain more representation sure. and, and uh, just more because I deeply care about this. And so, yes. you know, I've invested in a handful Repeat the of question just more clearly so that people, we have it on the. the oh, podcast. the question is just more of like, you know, what have I done to help women of color um, or you know, I, I would just frame it as more diverse representation on uh, the entrepreneurship table, which I'm guessing is more of like cap tables and stuff. But um, just I've been doing some of my own investing. And so I've invested in probably a little more than a dozen companies. I only and I only invest in diverse founding teams. Like I deeply believe that if you are not if you like if you are not looking thinking about diversity from the moment you're founding the company, it's an uphill battle. And a lot of the wealth that's created is created at that founding team level. And so that's something that's super important to me. And what's been interesting is actually now that I'm more on the fund side, so now I can be giving money to fund managers. Like I'm only, I'm investing in diverse fund managers. And so I'm like, even as you're thinking about public markets, or even as we're thinking about kind of, you know, a, a venture funds or whatever, like, you know, I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I'm put and I'm backing people that I know share the same values as mine. Well, Katrina, it has been an honor and it's been too short. I wish we had three hours instead of this 50 minutes. Um, but thank you so much for the time. Um, on behalf of YouTube, Stanford, and the whole ETL community, thank you so much. Um, uh, ETL, Stanford and YouTube, that is our ETL session for this week. Uh, please join us next week when we will have Heidi Roizen and Aisha Evans from Zooks, I believe, will be um, here for ETL, which will also be a fantastic talk. Um, and you can follow us on um, our YouTube channel for eCorner or go to ecorner.stanford.edu. Thank you, everybody.